Welcome to our 10th Organization of Biological Field Stations live from the field event. My name is Carrie Winninger with Sonoma State University's Center for Environmental Inquiry. We encourage you to view past recordings and learn more at thevirtualfield.org. For instructors in the audience, be sure to visit thevirtualfield.org to access supplementary materials for your students, such as an instructor guide for live from the field events with suggested assignments, and an event resources document full of publications about the specific topics being discussed today. Here are some guidelines for the webinar. All participants are muted and your video cameras are off. Please use the chat button to communicate with us during the event, remembering to choose all panelists and attendees so everyone will see your comments. Now, please submit your questions for the researchers using the Q&A button, not the chat. This button might not be as familiar to you, so try and find it now and message me in the chat if you can't find it. If you're here as part of a college class, please type the word student in front of your question so we can prioritize it. And it's important to make sure your full name is visible so you receive attendance credit. If your Zoom username is different than your actual name, be sure to type that out with your question as well. Also, welcome if you're watching streaming live on Facebook, we will try to get to your questions too. Now I'm going to introduce Dustin Angel. We are so fortunate to have as our moderator, someone with a foot in both the science and art worlds. Dustin Angel is the Director of Education at Archibald Biological Station in Venus, Florida. In addition to nine years of environmental education at Archibald, Dustin draws on a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree for his conservation photography projects, which highlight the work of field biologists and other conservation professionals and volunteers. Without further ado, I will turn this over to Dustin. Hi, right, thank you, Carrie. Uh, thank you all for joining live from the field. We welcome classes, faculty, and other participants from across the nation and the world. In this series, we take you on virtual field trips to research sites from the, around the country and the world. As you see today, we are going to three different places where we have scientist and artist pairs. Live from the field events are a project of the virtual field. That is an international coalition of over 50 field stations and marine laboratories. Uh, this National Science Foundation funded effort brings the field to you. You can find out more about events like this at thevirtualfield.org. Today, we're getting a snapshot of science and art collaborations that are supporting conservation. Field stations and marine laboratories are valuable interdisciplinary settings where science students science faculty, and visiting science researchers mix and share ideas. But less known, however, are the productive collaborations with artists. Through the eyes of visiting artists, both the researchers and the public can see science and conservation in new ways. In addition, arts projects not only reach new audiences, but relate to them differently than science does alone. And that's because art, unlike objective-minded science papers, can purposefully address the audience's emotions and values and encourage civic engagement. So I'm excited to moderate this session of Live from the Field. Uh, our three examples of art and science will include a beach debris community art project in Massachusetts, uh, a college art professor who invites his students to an island field station in California, and three, an outdoor art exhibit in the Florida Everglades National Park. Each team has prepared an eight minute video describing the project. After the videos, there'll be, uh, all those people will be available to answer your questions live. So that's about a half an hour from now. I encourage everyone to post your questions in the Q&A as we go along, you don't have to wait until the panel discussion to put your questions in. Please put them in as you go along and then we can sort through them. So our journey starts in the Northeast on Massachusetts picturesque Cape Cod. Here, the Center for Coastal Studies is dedicated to understanding, preserving and protecting marine ecosystems and the coastal environment through applied research education and 
public policy, policy initiatives. The center acknowledges, honors, and makes visible that this is the ancestral land of the Wampanoag and Nauset tribes. So let's take a look at our team here. We'll first hear from Laura Ludwig and Sarah Thornington. Laura has been working at the center for 11 years and she's the Marine Debris and Plastics Program Director. Sarah has been making art for conservation the last four years. She's the creator of A Year of Plastic, which brings awareness to plastic debris on Massachusetts beaches. So let's check out their eight minute video. Hey, Sarah. Hey, hey. Laura. Hey, I'm Laura Ludwig. I'm at the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown. I'm the director of the Marine Debris and Plastics Program. And uh, we just spent about five seconds picking up styrofoam, balloon strings, masks, and other litter here on this lovely beach. Um, uh, when I started out as a music major uh, in college, I had no idea that I would uh, spend my life um, studying plastic and uh, trying to solve some of the problems of plastic in the ocean. Um, I work with commercial fishermen to remove uh, lobster gear and other lost fishing gear from the bottom of the ocean by uh, using sonar and grappling. But I also have um, a really amazing group of volunteers that I work with to try to clean the beaches of Cape Cod and beyond. Um, cleaning beaches is a great thing to do, but there's a lot more you can do with it than just picking trash up. And we've been able to really look at what we're collecting on the beaches and uh, do some deep dives into the data to see where we can maybe solve some of the inputs. So in other words, I just picked up uh, another mask and um, one of the things that we're trying to do is, is uh, convey how many masks we find on beaches so people can be a little bit more careful about uh, them falling out of their pockets as they pull their gloves out. Um, well, a lot of the stuff that we pull off of the beaches is trash. Most of it is trash, but some of it's treasure. Uh, you just pulled that out of your pocket. <laughs> treasure in the form of $1 bills or in the form of materials that can be upcycled or turned into something else, reused in a different way uh, and kept out of the waste stream. Um, and one of the people that does a lot with that is Sarah and she'll tell you a little bit about it But the idea is that if you can convey some information to people who didn't already have it um, Then you're you're improving the the likelihood that someone might make a different choice down the road Sarah's conveyance um, has has a very artistic mo mode. So what it what, what is it you bring to our conversation Sarah? Hi, so I'm Sarah Thornington. I'm a photographer and also a marine debris artist. Um, I got started in marine debris art because I was picking up just masses of trash every time I went to the beach, every time I walked my dog. Um, and I decided to do a project where I kept track of everything I picked up. I did a beach cleanup every day for a year and I kept track of all of the plastic. I counted it, I sorted it, um, I washed it and cleaned it all. Um, and then when, and I ended up with almost 20,000 pieces, over 20,000 pieces of plastic that year, um, which I continue to keep going and getting free art supplies uh, from the beach. Um, but so I decided after having all of that amount of trash that I needed to do something with it. So my, what I have decided to do is I create art, I have shows, I have workshops, I have presentations, and I, make all of my art out of stuff that I pick up and stuff that Laura and the Beach Brigade find on their cleanups as well now. Um, for a while I was very particular about only using my own um, my own debris but now I'm like ah it doesn't matter whose debris it is. Um, this is a little puffin here that I made um, just completed. He's made out of a lot of zip ties and strapping bands and even a tire from a child's toy. Um, and one of the things that I found today is uh, balloon strings. I found a bunch of balloon strings while we were cleaning up for that little, literally a minute, and we found handfuls of, of trash. Um, and so this will hopefully start bringing thing, a legislation about no more balloon releases on the Cape. There's already a bunch of towns on Cape Cod that don't allow um, balloon releases, but there still are a lot that do. So it's data like this that helps us to get people to realize how much 
debris we're finding out here on our shores. It is a really good thing to clean trash off of beaches, regardless of what you do with it at the end of it, but it's an even better thing if you can count it and sort it, catalog it, and, and get it over time so you have a good base of uh, information to then take it up to the next level. We collect uh, lobster trap ID tags here around Cape Cod and on the coast of New Hampshire and Maine and each tag has identifying information on it so that we can then uh, find out how far it's traveled and how old it is um, and our hope is that we're going to be able to change some of the regulations about identifying marks on lobster tag traps so that we can remove that item from the from the waste stream. Uh, so far I think we have about 14,000 uh, lobster trap tags that we found in our collections. Um, how does somebody get into this? Well, my father was a big beachcomber and he would always bring home all the rope that he found on our islands in Maine when I was a little kid. Um, and I think that you don't know exactly where you're going in life until you get there. Yes. And um, I've spent 20 years working with plastics and I would encourage anyone who is interested in the science of um, polymerization uh, to, to take that uh, information with you when you clean your beach because um, plastics are uh, petroleum based um, for the most part um, and uh, there's a lot of the juries out on plant-based plastics right now because the polymer is actually essentially the same so the the results are the same if they're not treated quite right beach cleanups are just one way of um, providing data toward any kind of action items when I when I collect all this stuff and I, I get to work with artists like Sarah it is a way of communicating the issue of plastics on the uh, on the in a marine environment and of uh, instilling action in the people who are seeing it. So a lot of the uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds of fishing gear that we remove from the ocean uh, gets turned into sculptures that then can tell a story about the, the where it came from and what it's used for. And so a, a lot of our effort is to try to educate people who may not have thought of plastic in quite that way. It's everywhere. It is everywhere. And so one of the ways that we keep track of what we do is Center for Coastal Studies has a, a tally form that um, lists all the different types of debris that we have that's specific to the Cape um, so that we can keep track of it that way. I also use um, Ocean Conservancy has an app that I use on my phone um, so that I can enter it manual, uh, while I'm in the field. Um, both have challenges. Um, if you are, but um, they're so important. It's so important to track what you find because I can find this. I can make as many puffins as I want out of this, but until we have actual physical data of how many masks we're finding, how many balloons we're finding, how many little cigar tips we're finding, um, things don't get changed. And so with Laura, we have the Beach Brigade, which is fantastic. She's, I'll let her tell you about it, but she's, you know, got this great group of people. But for me individually, um, the, uh, it's tricky because- That's the right whale plane <laughs> going by. They're surveying for right whales. Um, because you can't do it all by yourself. If it's too cold or too windy or um, whatever, you, it's hard to, to track things on your phone it's hard to have a piece of paper that's blowing about outside um, so then it just adds time and um, dedication well and it really has been my practice to take it all home dump it out on a table afterward and count it in a nice quiet room with no snow no ice no wind no rain and about 12 volunteers so please join the beach brigade near you get some data clean some beaches and make some art and look at why the beach is, the trash is ending up on the beach in the first place and how you can do to stop it ever getting here. Thanks so much. Thanks guys. Well, you can move that I know, this is, this is for the one-eared man. <laughs>
with the Channel Islands National Park to support diverse types of research, education, and outreach across disciplines. The research station acknowledges, honors, and makes visible that these lands are the ancestral lands of the Chumash native peoples. So let's look at our team. Next, we'll hear, hear from Russ Bradley and Matt Fermansky. Russ is the director of the station. He has a master's in science and has been working at the station for four years. Uh, Matt has a master's in fine art and has been making art for conservation for 25 years. As a professor at California State University's Channel Islands, he involves art students in marine debris removal. Let's hear about their project with our next video. Hi there, everyone. My name is Russ Bradley, and I am the director of Cal State University Channel Islands, Santa Rosa Island Field Station in Channel Islands National Park. Very happy to be here today uh, and talk to you all. I am a marine and island ecologist and biologist. That's my background, and I got into this field partially because I had some pretty powerful transformative experiences when I was a student in high school and as an undergrad at a, a marine station. And as the director of the field station for the university, my job is to juggle a whole bunch of different balls. I work closely with the university, with faculty, with students, with student research, with our uh, management agency partners like Channel Islands National Park, with community members, with media, with fundraising. Um, all sorts of all sorts of different tasks to keep these kind of things going. Hi, my name is Matt Fermansky. I am art faculty here at California State University Channel Islands and uh, one of the faculty partners with the research station. Um, my background is in studio art, sculpture mostly, but uh, all kinds of other stuff as well, photography, painting, drawing. Um, my relationship with the station as, as a faculty who takes students out to have these transformative experiences that Russ is talking about, as well as a volunteer helping on some of the big projects that they're working on, including marine debris that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, all of those things, um, as well as my own interest in science, engineering, geology, biology, uh, all of those things come into my own artwork as well. Um, and it is a really amazing part of uh, what the field station and the university, especially the art program, is working on. And one thing more that I'll add is that even though I'm a scientist, I've always been interested and passionate about the arts because I really feel that it gives me an opportunity to use different parts of my brain than when I'm using science, and I think that's just important. I would echo that as well. So we are here today to talk about our collaborative project um, involving marine debris removal on the California Channel Islands. And this is a project that is focused on removal of marine debris on Santa Cruz and Santa Rosa Island in Channel Islands National Park. And the project is uh, funded, uh, funded by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Marine Debris Program. Uh, and the, the other core partners are us at the university and the National Park Service and Channel Islands National Park. We have some other partners that are very involved as well. Island Packers Company, which provides a lot of in-kind um, donations as well as transportation to and from the islands, as well as the Nature Conservancy, TNC, which is a, a really nice partner in allowing us access and use of facilities at their Santa Cruz Island facility. So the, some of the big questions that are involved in this project are to document um, marine debris on the islands, uh, what type, um, location, the seasonal variation, uh, the relative change to historical amounts and to remove that debris as well. And we have a fair amount of debris here, though even just on our campus, this is a small portion. It's made about a quarter of the debris that we have um, right now, a combination yeah. of mega bags full of rope and buoys. And we only have, a, like Russ was saying, a small portion uh, surrounding us. Uh, there are literally tons that we remove every year. And some of the research questions that are involved in this are, uh, how potentially are changes in local fishery um, policy uh, impacting the rate of, of, of deposition of fishing gear on beaches? 
and we are also interested in how uh, marine debris can affect um, the ecology of these island environments and how removing that debris might um, have positive ecological benefits. Another big component of this collaboration is an education and outreach component. And that's kind of where I come in with the art program and the university and my students, as well as other artists in the area, uh, locally and even further afield. Um, we take this marine debris after it comes back and gets processed in the lab and use it to create found object art, collage art, all different kinds of stuff, sculpture. Um, we have exhibitions uh, at local venues, including breweries, galleries, and museums. Uh, we put out this information um, with uh, our university as well as other local schools. Uh, so there's a huge outreach component. Um, much of this debris that's around us right now is being staged to go to a local production of um, a, a SpongeBob kind of uh, theatrical thing at a local uh, elementary and high school. So that's the kind of thing that happens after the science is done in the lab. Um, but using the same materials. So this project began as a effort to compare what the, the current situation of debris on beaches was to some work that had been done decades before. And I think it's really important to mention that this project started as a student research project, Absolutely. as a capstone um, research project by a student in our, in our uh, environmental science and resource management um, department who went on to um, develop this into a master's project as well. Um, but one of the other things that's important about this project is that um, it is definitely not a straight line linear process. I think there were some assumptions in, in the in initial planning for the project that turned out to not be logistically feasible. And there's also been some things that have been discovered um, in terms of the research focus that now we are um, working with some unique new technology to, in the lab, assess the chemical composition of a lot of this debris and the, particularly the plastics that are associated with it to look at their, um, their structure and their, um, and their origin. Absolutely. Um, some of the interesting things that come up with the um, measuring, uh, uh, the quantification and the collection of this debris, which are probably unique to our island situation, are just the logistics of collecting this stuff off the beach. Um, you know, the university uh, doesn't go out there and get to drive a truck down to the beach and load everything up. Oftentimes we are, or all of the times, uh, we are using UTVs um, on um, minimally maintained dirt roads that lead to a trailhead. We're then packing um, many miles with frame packs out to a beach uh, collecting the debris, uh, timing that with tides uh, and weather conditions, um, hiking all of that stuff back to a staging area, loading up the vehicles, driving the vehicles to a dock, unloading the vehicles, coordinating with uh, some of our partners, EJ Harrison and Island Packers to load the debris onto the boat, get it back to the mainland and to the university's uh, labs and unload it. Uh, a lot of this takes place with uh, volunteers and station staff. Many students are involved from all different disciplines, from the art program, from ESRM, from the, bio the biological sciences, uh, everywhere. Yeah, and I just want to say to all the students out there that there are, there are many opportunities while you are in undergrad to get involved with these collaborative projects in some fashion. And I just really think strongly that you need to take advantage of those opportunities that are in front of you right now, because you're gonna learn a lot of great things. You're gonna be able to help um, build your resume and just lead you onward in the career path that you wanna follow. So thank you everyone. Uh, we uh, look forward to answering any questions you might have and uh, just are really thankful that uh, you spent some time with us here today. Absolutely, I'm Matt Fermansky again. Thanks a lot and um, fire your questions away yeah. right here. Russ Bradley, uh, looking forward to talking to you. That was great. Uh, now our last stop is here where I am right now in uh, Central and South Florida. Now in our 81st year, Archbold Biological Station is an independent non-for-profit organization. 
The mission of Archbold is to build and share the scientific knowledge needed to protect the life, lands, and waters of the heart of Florida and beyond. Archbold acknowledges and honors that the headwaters of the Florida Everglades, where we work, are the ancestral lands and waters of several indigenous groups, including the Seminole and Miccosukee tribes, um, and also the historic Calusa, Timucuan, and Miami, and Bell Glades people. So let's look at our Archbold team. We, lastly, we will hear from Dr. Hillary Swain and Deborah Mitchell. Hillary has been Archbold's executive director since 1995. Hillary's research interests are in the application of conservation biology to preserve uh, design, land management, and planning for natural communities and endangered species. Deborah has been making art for conservation for 15 years. She first teamed up with Archbold in 2015 to enhance conservation using the visual arts. Since then, Mitchell has introduced about 25 artists to Archbold, completed a field guide, and curated exhibitions based on field stations. Her long-term project, Wild Observations, explores changes in wildlife corridors, combining scientific research with artistic interpretation. Now get those questions in the Q and A because the question and answer part will happen after this video. We know that humans can benefit from careful land, water, and species management. And on a smaller scale, we understand that water flows from upland areas through wetlands and coastal estuaries, affecting our food supply. We need to support environmental conservation, which addresses the ecology of fire, water, and endangered species, and human settlement, while strategically planning for a healthier future. My name is Deborah Mitchell. I am a Miami Beach-based visual artist specializing in mixed media. Essentially, I like to come out to the field like this place in Everglades National Park, take photographs, document the information I can find, and then I go back to the studio, talk to friends who are biologists or cultural leaders, and put it all together. I was born in Canada to Scottish immigrants and spent the winters of my youth following the Atlantic Migration Corridor to a warmer climate. I have vivid memories of birds flying in sync with our family car as we pass through the wetlands. And I really feel like those experiences are now mirrored in my practice. I want to be a part of the environmental story. So as a self-taught artist, not a documentarian, I approach how our existence has had an effect on the environment. I believe that everything is connected and by getting out into the field with field stations and even park rangers, biologists, um, and various cultural leaders, this helps me better understand and interpret the work. Like this one, this is Ursus Americanus Floridanus. I started the concept while uh, at Arch Archbold Biological Station, photographed a bear skull after I had seen the bears in the wild at the station, a mom and her two cubs. And then I transcribed sections of the Florida Fish and Wildlife Report behind it and re-photographed it. So people could really get a sense of the idea of the skull of this beautiful mammal and then what the current conditions and recommendations are for it from our local government. One of the best things about my job is that I get to get in the backcountry with uh, kayaks and boats and sometimes swamp buggies and helicopters and planes. I really love that part of it. Artists and scientists tend to approach problems with sensitiveness. They really don't fear the unknown and prefer leaps to incremental steps. So they make natural partners. So as you can see here, this is a great example of the vultures continuously playing on the bird cube. This is about a five by five foot uh, sculpture in the middle of the Great Lawn here in Royal Palm that really focuses solely on birds. The inspiration was what would Audubon say if he could see us now? What would the dialogue look like? Surely he'd be really happy with the improvements that we've made in scientific research, um, uh, genetic discovery, and of course, um, documenting everything. 
However, surely he'd be upset with the uh, fragmentation and loss of habitat and many of the other challenges that we have nowadays, just trying to have enough space for everything. I think that's why specifically um, uh, conservation easements and making sure that we preserve enough land up and down, especially our state in Florida, is so important. So how did I create a storytelling project that explores the ecological and cultural changes transforming these very best wild places. We identified my research question by talking through what I had accomplished and how to best expand upon it. Visiting field stations and residences and flyways helped me understand how everything is connected. So in a sense, this is my method and the results are in the exhibition's installation and public outreach. Hello, Hilary Swain. I'm the director of Archbold Biological Station in South Central Florida. We as scientists benefit tremendously from artists visiting Archbold and Deborah Mitchell uh, over the last few years has become one of our closest science artist collaboration and her ability to convey our messages, to communicate with new groups, to bring artists to visit here, others with other um, media, other interests, has been a burgeoning and really wonderful relationship for which we're deeply appreciative. It's made our science more effective with the public. One of the wonderful things about having, uh, you know, artists visit Archbold like Deborah Mitchell is you can take them in the field to visit research projects and just see this inspirational and sort of curiosity well up in them, just the same way it wells up in a scientist. So when I brought Deborah and told her about our work on Florida black bears, she was intrigued. We showed her sandy trails like this one at Archbold, overgrown habitat where you would often find a black bear. And we talked about the data we had on bears um, moving across the landscape on Archbold on all surrounding areas. And she got really fascinated. When we lent her an artifact, this very same skull, she produced this wonderful um, piece of art. To me, it just embodies the sort of the curiosity and the beauty of nature that's appreciated by both scientists and by artists and her ability to convey that to a much bigger audience than we can uh, convey just with science alone. So we're very grateful for our partnership or our alliance with scientists and artists because it allows us to reach a new audience and for that new audience to connect with us. Not only does uh, a piece of art convey science and the curiosity about nature, but a piece of art can also be a powerful mechanism for conservation action. So Archbold is always extremely interested in how we can put our science into conservation action, how we can make, make a difference in the world. And art enables us to do that. So the sort of image, the image of the bear floating over the facts of wildlife, ties into conservation initiatives such as the one Archbold is currently working on. That is um, pr promoting, providing the science background and providing communications and storytelling for a wonderful landscape project, the Florida Wildlife Corridor, a proposed 18 million acre landscape across Florida, 10 million acres of which is already protected, which got re legislative approval in 2021. And art projects like Deborah help to make the case for conservation in ways that uh, scientists do not really envisage or are unable to communicate effectively. So we're very grateful for that partnership. Well, we are going to move to our question and answer section. So if you're a student, please write, make sure it's a student in your name um, and that your full name is visible. We probably won't have time to get to all of your questions, but there'll be a follow-up email where we will try to get as many of the, the, the questions answered as we can. Um, the panelists are going to try to keep their answers to a minute or less so we can get to as many of these questions as we can. Um, and so all of our panelists are going to get their videos up. It looks like you already did that. Wonderful. 
All right. So I am going to ask the first question. This is Carrie here. I'm going to get us all started by asking all of the scientists briefly the same question. And then I'll pose a question to all of the artists. So for the scientists, let's start with Laura Ludwig, then Russ Bradley, and then finish with Hilary Swain. So in that order, can you tell us the first time you worked with an artist? Tell us about that. Who reached out to who? And how is it different from being approached by a visiting scientist? The first artist that ever reached out to me was a woman named Orly Gangber. Um, she had been working in the medium of rope for many years, but they were two-dimensional sculptures. And when she learned that I was running a buyback program for uh, derelict fishing gear in, uh, or end-of-life fishing gear in uh, Maine, um, she uh, heard that there was a little bit of rope kicking around. And so I wound up over the next three years securing for her over 300,000 pounds of rope that she then created uh, sculpt sculptures with. So my first artist uh, experience working with fishing gear and uh, marine debris um, was the largest to date. Um, and her name again is Orly Ganger. And I encourage you to check out her sculptures made with rope from the fishery. So I'll go next. One of my first experiences with working with an artist was not with this project, but in my, my previous job managing this long-term research on these islands called the Farallon Islands, west of San Francisco. And I worked with an author named Catherine Roy, who makes these incredible um, books for young people and really utilizes her art as a key component of that. And this was a book about great white sharks. And this is uh, an artist who is very interested in how to create realistic interpretations of both the, the biology of the sharks and their um, activities and make that relatable and make it scientifically accurate. And, and it was fantastic. And I remember one image in particular where she compared the shark uh, to a jumbo jet and, and sort of had drawn this jet shark and talked about the different aspects of its biology and how, you know, how, how that was an interesting way to see this amazing. So um, I could go next. Um, I, the, the first artist I worked with at Archbold was Molly Doctor, who does a wonderful woodblock print. I mean, really extraordinary. She's moved to California. You guys should check her out sometime. Um, but I thought I'd try and concentrate on the second half of the question. What's the difference between what a scientist uh, approaches you with and what is an artist? In fact, the laundry list is pretty similar. You know, scientists and artists both need, they need help with ID, they need help with information, relevant papers, you know, they need help with locations. Where can I find this? Where should I go? They need help with context, you know, how does this fit into the big picture of all of the diversity of things that you're working with um, and the relevance of it for, you know, sort of societal issues. They have other commonalities. Both groups, once they get to know a field station, start to bring other visitors. So you have this wonderful uh, chain of um, scientists and visitor and artists visitors coming as a result of those initial connections. Um, I would say the one big difference between visiting scientists and visiting art artists is artists know how to market and to communicate to big audiences. So scientists are generally very good at communicating to other scientists and artists are quite good at communicating to the public beyond other artists. So that has been one of the huge differences between the community and outreach um, and storytelling that writers and artists bring to us. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. We're going to try the same thing with our artists. We have a different question, though. We'll go in the order of Sarah Thornington, Matt Fermansky, and Deborah Mitchell. So your question is, can you tell us your aha moment when you realized you wanted to work with scientists at a field station or a marine lab? So Sarah. So um, I guess it has to be I look at the plastic that I collect, I always have kind of looked at it as a naturalist. So I look at the degradation of different plastics and um, I have one of my pieces is tennis balls that I found on the beach and it goes from like the perfect tennis ball to the little nub tennis ball and all the different um, variations thereof. But by learning as I go, I need people like Laura to go so that I can say, what the heck is this? And I need people to help um, just educate me as to what I'm finding and why I would be finding certain things on the beach. 
I would, yeah, I would echo some of those same things. I think I was lucky enough to grow up with uh, one foot in the art world and one foot in the world of science and recognizing that an artist's studio and a scientist's lab were very, very similar in a lot of ways, right? And uh, there was a lot of play and investigation and uh, that those things were very, very common um, in, in both worlds and both universes. Uh, and I think, um, having some early exposure to field station work um, and working outside, uh, it, it just seemed like a natural fit uh, for me as an artist that, uh, um, you know, art, as, as was mentioned a little while ago, can be transcendent, right? It can, it can walk in different, um, different places and uh, being able to pull from these different resources and make something creative was something that just uh, almost came naturally. So it's something that I, it was, it was a no brainer uh, for me. And I wanted to get my students involved in the same thing. So Matt, I mean, I feel very similar to your response. And I have to say, Sarah, I love your background. That is amazing. <laughs> so lovely. And, and thank you everybody for having us and being with us today. Um, for me to properly answer that question, I'm gonna say two things prior is the first thing is 22 years ago when I had a baby, I knew my work had to be redirected to doing something for the environment. I knew I had to try to make the world some kind of better place somehow through the arts. Fast forward through the years, I did some residencies. One was in Big Cypress. And, and like you were saying, Matt, just building on those experiences gave me more and more knowledge to kind of make my way up to field stations. In Big Cypress, I saw my first Florida panther in the wild, and that just gave me even more drive and desire to learn more. So I was out planning a trip with um, the gentleman from Audubon on Lake Okeechobee, and he said, why don't you check out Archbold? I didn't know anything about Archbold. And from the moment I went, I realized it was just my holy grail of nature information. And I've never looked back. It's just been so influential and, and, and wonderful for my practice. Great answers, everybody. That's a perfect intro to get us going into some student questions. So the first student question, I think I'm going to direct this to both Laura and to Russ. Um, so the student asks, although rare, are there any good things from the debris ecologically, like the larger floating ones working as shelter? Um, it's a trick question. Um, I would say that the larger ones floating as shelter are not necessarily positive things. Um, and in fact, um, there's a type of fishery called um, a, um, it's sort of an artisanal fishery that uses what they call fads, which are basically big wads of trash on the surface of the ocean that are used to um, attract larger fish that then the artisanal fishermen can go and, um, and uh, retrieve the fish uh, that, are, that are aggregated underneath it. So yes, the fad, which is, I think it stands for floating aggregate device or something like that, but it's traditionally made from junk fishing gear or any plastic things that float. Um, what they're finding is that there are communities of not so beneficial creatures living on these things and these and 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 also that some creatures are eating the plastics that they are attaching to. The plastics also um, uh, adsorb a lot of the toxins that are in the ocean. So there's, it, it may appear that it might provide a little shade or a little um, ref refuge for um, certain animals, but the there the jury's out on whether that is um, a net positive, so to speak. Um, so um, in terms of uh, land-based debris, um, I'll let Russ uh, answer that, but um, I have seen nothing positive from debris that is um, on the land. Um, and uh, even when an octopus might occupy um, a piece of tr a marine trash, particularly if it's plastic, um, the the long-term effects can be uh, pretty debilitating for the for the animals that are using it. Yeah, I'll follow up on that. Thanks very much, Laura. The, a large piece of debris that's floating may be able to shelter, you know, certain fish, certain time, but it comes ashore. And one of the big things about large pieces of debris is they become smaller pieces of debris. And the, even down to this, you know, issue of microplastics in the environment. But even some of the larger, you know, contiguous elements or say some huge ball of rope will shed individual plastic fibers, will shed bits, bits of the rope that um, from, from my experience, animals like the ones behind me, the Northern elephant seals can actually get, 
you know, in, entangled pinnipeds, you know, exploring these, these, you know, some large aggregation of rope that opens up an animal actually get able to get its neck body, you know, inside and with, with rope or, or with fishing line can, can create these constrictions. So even the, the larger bits of debris that seem a bit innocuous at time, eventually those are going to break down. Those are going to, you know, release more plastic in the environment and basically become easier for animals to get entangled. I'm seeing that it's 3.50. I know some college students, uh, are their classes are ending right now. So if you need to hop off, um, now's the time. And remember, we will try to get to the other questions in our email that we'll send out. But for the rest of you, we will stay on at least to the end of the hour and get to some more of these questions. Um, let's go with another student question. Hopefully the student will stay on uh, for Matt. Do you get somewhat picky with what debris you use in your art? And I think it'd be answer it for the students too. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. You look at all of the stuff that you collect and you, you see straws or, you know, all kinds of weird stuff, pen caps, and, and you think, well, this is, you know, this is trash. This is, this is trash. But, you know, you get enough of those things and you get somebody with a kind of creative mindset um, and they make amazing things out of it. So it's easy to think what, as you're collecting it or picking it up, like this is nothing. Um, and then to see what some students come up with, they, part of the challenge and part of the aha moment is like seeing something that you thought was, you were being maybe picky about become something incredible and informative or challenging. And so I always, when we're collecting, uh, that's always one of the things in the forefront of my mind. Yeah, it's cool to find some amazing piece of weird, you know, space trash that's fallen in the water from a launch or something else. But generally, you're picking up plastic chunks, and uh, that becomes that becomes something uh, you know important to turn into a material, as you would use clay or stone or something else. So. Wonderful. I am going to direct this next question towards Deborah. How do you determine which organizations or individuals to reach out to? Would you define these relationships as transactional, reciprocal, or in another way? So my art practice is rather experience-based. As we were talking about, for example, with the Bear Project, typically I'll go out, oh, my, my interest will be piqued by something and then I'll start to reach out to people who may be able to inform me better. I'm not, I'm not a fan of the word transactional for this. What I do think has been super valuable over the years, and I've learned this the hard way, is building relationships. You, you do have to give, you have to give back. I mean, kindness and humility is definitely a part, I think, of good relationships. So um, let's say I'm reaching out to a tribal member or maybe um, someone who's going to give me an aerial flyover. Definitely in social media, you are promoting that other organization as doing something very, very valid. But in addition to those public statements, I always try to kind of keep nurturing that, that private, those personal chats and reaching out and seeing how people are doing. Does that answer your question? If only they could tell us, but I think that was a great answer. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah, that was great. Uh, this next one is for Hillary. How has the relationship between field stations and artists changed in the last three decades? And where do you see it headed? Oh, well, I'm clearly dated here, but that's good. Um, so what I would say is that uh, over that period, there has been a growing recognition of the importance of this collaboration. And you can see that, I mean, people are putting nice things in the chat, you know, there's there's every field station will have some kind of program and it's got beyond the more traditional artist and residence sort of program. This is really a very broad engagement. <clears throat> I would say what's actually changed is the recognition from uh, from those outside as the importance of those collaborations. For example, for a scientist, you can definitely get important bonus points when you're putting in a grant proposal. If you include an artist collaboration in your broader impacts, funding agencies and foundations, the donors all appreciate this and understand the value for it. I think the other thing is, 
where artists, the collaboration, where it has really helped field stations is to bring in this entire cadre of people that know how to communicate. So in the way that this is not just an, a communication mechanism for us, but this is a training for scientists. We learn from artists how to better communicate ourselves. So we A, um, work with people who are very good at communicating. B, they provide us with lots of avenues. Um, so that really helps us. And C, it's made us better at communicating our own message, whether this is writers or artists or musicians. Um, so I think uh, artists are changing us as much as they're changing the art that we provide from, from field stations. Wow, you guys are all so eloquent about this. Um, I would like to ask Matt the next question. So why bring science and conservation into a college art class? How do students approach this kind of project differently than other assignments and what kind of challenges or benefits might there be? That's a good question. I think that, uh, you know, part of part of having a liberal arts education is to try to tackle some big problems that we face as 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 human beings. And uh, I think using something that students are passionate or interesting about interested in uh, and coupling that with some of these these issues that that we as as uh, as people as stewards of the planet. Uh, how do you use both of those things to to come up with some kind of uh, uh, simpatico um, uh, answer? Uh, I think is is super important, and it's in the in the spirit of education and of challenging people with uh, with how to reach a goal through your passion. Um, I think that I think that those are important things, um, and they're, they're something that you know they're things that are close to my heart, and, and they're good ways of of introducing uh, conservation and art. Uh, to a class. So. All right, this next one is for Sarah, and it's good to see more questions are are hot, are coming in hot right now. Um, this one is in in what ways can art shift individual perceptions of the environment, inform the public, uh, encourage civic engagement, and can can these or should these be goals, artistic goals? So I'm gonna start with the end of that. And for our type of art, I think absolutely they should be goals. Um, so I've had a, I had a, my, one of my last shows was at the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy and it was geared towards children and families. And I had both art and just piles of actual debris. And the conversations that came out of that between the families and when I was there and able to answer questions of why are there so many shotgun shells on the beach mom? you know, is so important because of course people aren't out on our beaches shooting, but then you have the whole, you know, ocean currents and rivers flowing to the water. And so you get all kinds of um, conversations going like that. And it also, when they see piles and piles of toy shovels and um, that sort of stuff that when people see this type of art with their own eyes, it makes them realize that they are responsible and that we're all culpable in, in the issues that we have with plastics in the ocean. I can't believe it, but it is time to wrap up. So we have one final question and this is what the student specified for all panelists, but I'm sure we won't have time for all six of you to answer. So I'll let you all jump in. Are there summer opportunities such as internships or ways we can volunteer for students to get involved with work at field stations or with collaboration projects? Who wants to take that? Yes, there are lots and lots and lots. Absolutely. So if Reach you go to, to yeah. Yeah, sorry. Go on. If you go to the OBFS, the Organization of Biological Field Sites, you can see the um, the logo under Kerry's um, uh, um, page there. Um, that'll give you lists of field stations where you can connect with them and find out if there are opportunities. Sorry, Matt, I didn't mean to overwrite you, but that is a place where you can find out where field stations are. I think in general, there's lots of um, research experience opportunities at Field Station. Um, there are a lot of um, educational opportunities and some conservation. I am less aware of opportunities for students with uh, art projects, so I should hand that over and see if anyone else can add a thought on that. I have just a very quick thought. Um, one of my most foundational experiences was volunteering 
out in a national preserve early on in my career. And I'm still friends with all those people when we were redoing GPS positions in old campsites. And it got me into the back country that I otherwise had not been able to see. So I strongly recommend to anyone interested first to maybe volunteer in a couple of different organizations, get your feet wet, find out what you love, who you click with, and then think long-term, think about policy, think about what you really want to do. Do you wanna help move the needle? Do you wanna get involved in the political side? Do you wanna just create art? I think those volunteering experiences can really be very helpful. Matt, you wanted to say something earlier. Do you want to jump in um, now? It was said much more eloquently by, uh, by, uh, by other people. So uh, yeah, I, I would just echo those things. Reach out locally, you know, find a, your field station and, and uh, reach out to them. Uh, look at local artists and, and uh, go from there. Yeah, and um, also wanted to add the recognition that volunteering isn't necessarily an option for everybody. So people have family responsibilities and financial responsibilities, but there are specific opportunities at field stations. The National Science has one called the REU program that provide you know substantial support for that experience. So um, it's not the only way to go, and certainly recognition that that you know that there need to be options for uh, for for everybody to do this. And just following up from Matt, I remember feeling pretty shy as an undergraduate, but y'all are very friendly. So just reach out to your local folks or someone even further away. You don't know the opportunities till you ask. Yeah, the uh, uh, I'll just add briefly on Hillary's point there that um, I always like to say, seize the opportunities that are in front of you right now. Like you may be thinking, oh, this is what I want to do in the future. But right now, in the present there are, there, are, there are lots of options to be part of these projects. And there are facilities and stations like our own, which to Hillary's point, recognize the financial constraints and have funding available for student research and science and the arts, um, uh, it, it, et cetera. There may be more opportunities than you think. So take that first step, reach out and find out what's available. And I'll add just um, keep emailing people. If you email someone and you don't hear back, it doesn't mean they intentionally didn't email you back. It's easy for an email to get lost in the sea of emails that are that are out there. Uh, so let's let's uh, close out here. I just wanted to say thank you to our presenters, Laura Ludwig, Sarah Thornington, Russ Bradley, Matt Fermansky, Hillary Swain, and Deborah Mitchell. We also want to thank the Organization of Biological Field Stations and the Center for Environmental Inquiry at Sonoma State University and Carrie Winninger. Uh, you can learn more about the series of virtual events at thevirtualfield.org and cei.sonoma.edu, which is in the chat there. Thank you to the National Science Foundation again for funding this project and to all the wonderful people behind the scenes who made this possible. We will be emailing all of you in the next few days. If you're on Facebook only watching this, you will obviously not get this email. We don't have your email. So if you want to get emails, make sure to go and follow the links to actually sign up for events. This email will have uh, three things, a follow-up answers, the questions we didn't address, a link to a recording of this event, and a link to a very short survey um, how you use the event, what you enjoyed, other event themes you might be interested in and suggestions. This is to help us uh, find funding and improve these in the future. We're putting the survey in the chat. Um, and if you'd like to copy and paste, you can grab that before we end. We hope to see you at future Live from the Field events. And thank you and goodbye from the field. So one thing we like to do is we as we go out, we're gonna give a big <laughs> wave so everybody can turn their camera on. <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye.